Lastly, before I get into our message, it was a, a big week for our nation. Uh, lots of tears of joy, lots of tears of lament in regards to the Supreme Court uh, ruling. And uh, I wrote a pastoral kind of response that I'll be sending out to our church either today or tomorrow. And my hope that I would be able to offer some uh, words that could help you navigate wherever you're at on the spectrum uh, something that's quite significant in our country. And so if you don't sign, if you don't have the, uh, you know, access to the emails or follow me on social media, uh, feel free to sign up for that uh, because you'll just hear my heart uh, for what's happening in our nation. Uh, we're starting a series on the Holy Spirit, or we're in a series on the Holy Spirit and continuing that. And um, just before I read our text, just a, just a quick thing. Some of you are wondering what happened to Rich's hand. Um, so I broke my finger uh, this past Monday. Uh, I, I was watching uh, uh, the first place New York Mets, and um, that's right. And uh, Rosie uh, got me tickets, a Father's Day gift to sit on the third row behind the dugout. Just uh, tremendous. And by the fifth inning, there was a fly ball. Uh, that came up, and I looked up, and when I saw it coming my direction, I don't want to tell you what I said, but when I came up in my direction, uh, I said, it's coming my way, and uh, <laughs> something like that, and, uh, and it literally, I was sitting here, there was another guy sitting right here, it came like right here, I didn't have to move, and both of us put our hand up, and uh, the ball just fractured my, my, my finger. And uh, immediately, uh, I, I go, you know, ouch, and I, I said something else besides that, and ouch, and, and uh, I just want to clear this up, because every person that I've told this story to, to the doctor, to my kid's teacher, to everyone else, they have one question that they ask, and you're asking the same question. What's the question? No, I didn't catch the ball. I didn't, I, I, no. It hits me, I go, ah, and, uh, and then some little boy picks it up and goes, I got it, I got it, and I was, I was so upset at that little kid. I, 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 I. <laughs> and uh, so, no, I didn't catch the ball, and I was very angry about that, and, and uh, that was the fifth inning, and uh, Rosie said, are you okay? And I said, no, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. My hand was shaking like this the whole time. No, I'm good. <laughs> She said, I think we should go. I said, no, we, we're not going to go. We're just fine. And, and then we went, and I got an x-ray, and it was fractured and all that. So uh, all that to say, you better not touch this finger at the end of the service, all right? Shake this hand. Don't touch this hand, all right? All right. Woo. All right, let's, get, let's move on here. Uh, John chapter 16. I'm going to talk today about the Holy Spirit being the shy member of the Trinity, the shy member of the trinity and what it means for us what it means to understand the holy spirit in maybe a fresh way and what it means that the holy spirit wants to make us shy as well john chapter 16 verse 12 we're actually reading from the message uh paraphrase i often use the new international version but i'll be reading from the message today hear the word of the lord jesus says to his disciples i still have many things to tell you but you can't Handle them now, but when the friend comes, the spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. He won't draw attention to himself, but will make sense out of what is about to happen, and indeed, out of all that I have done and said. He will honor me. He will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father has is also mine. That is why I've said he takes from me and delivers to you. I want to emphasize uh, where it says right here, the Holy Spirit won't draw attention to himself but will make sense out of what is about to happen and indeed out of all that I have done and said. The Holy Spirit is the shy member of the Trinity. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, breathe on us now through your Spirit. Open up our ears that we may hear what you want us to hear. Open our eyes that we may see what you want us to see. Open our hearts that we would receive every gift of the Holy Spirit this day. We pray these things in Christ's name. And everyone said, 
Amen. One of my favorite things to do over the years has been to uh, watch these late night uh, television shows. I love these shows with like Jimmy Fallon and his humor and his creativity. I love folks like Stephen Colbert with his wit and his ability to uh, really uh, 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 bring awareness to the cultural landscape that we're in. Uh, I used to watch Arsenio Hall back in the day. Remember Arsenio Hall? Of course you remember Arsenio Hall. Uh, but all of these late night comics and, and, and TV hosts really uh, learned what they've learned from the great Johnny Carson, the great Johnny Carson. Johnny Carson uh, was one of the great just entertainers uh, in our history. But what made Johnny Carson and his show great wasn't just his presence. It was also the presence of his sidekick, Ed McMahon. And Ed McMahon was a great entertainer in his own right. Ed McMahon will go on to do things in his own own right, but what made uh, their, their show pretty cool was that at the beginning of every show, Ed McMahon had a particular role. He had a particular goal, and that was to shine the spotlight on Johnny. And so as the show would begin, Ed would say, here's Johnny. That's what he'd say. And then the show come out, everybody cheers and all that. And it was just wonderful, but Ed McMahon had one goal, to shine the spotlight on Johnny Carson. As we look at our text this week on John chapter 16, I could not help but to think that the Holy Spirit is a kind of uh, cosmic Ed McMahon because the Holy Spirit has one goal, and that is to shine the spotlight on Jesus Christ. And so while Ed McMahon says, here's Johnny, the Holy Spirit, if you can hear it, says, here's Jesus, here's Jesus. The Holy Spirit has one goal. And that is to shine the spotlight on Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, as the New Testament theologian Dale Bruner has said, the Holy Spirit is most present when Jesus is most central. The Holy Spirit in our lives, in our churches, in our preachings. How do you know the Holy Spirit is present? The Holy Spirit is most present when Jesus is most central. We often believe that because certain things might happen emotionally, that when certain things happen, that's how we know the Holy Spirit is present in our lives. If a healing comes, if you're feeling good, oh, the Holy Spirit is here. But what we're going to see today is that the Holy Spirit is most present when Jesus is most central. And so to talk about the Holy Spirit being shy doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is timid. When you read the book of Acts, you see that the Holy Spirit is marked by power. We see signs and wonders. We see healings. We see transformation take place. To say that the Holy Spirit is, is shy is not speaking about timidity. It's not speaking about uh, temperament. It's not talking about personality. To say that the Spirit is shy means that the Holy Spirit has no problem taking a back seat to Jesus. That the Holy Spirit wants to glorify Jesus. And as we think about what this means for our lives, what we're going to discover is that we are most in the Spirit, and the Spirit is most in us when our lives are radically oriented around Jesus Christ and radically oriented around the blessing of others. In John chapter 16, we have this remarkable words coming from our Lord Jesus. A couple of weeks ago, I mentioned that Jesus gives a staggering word to his disciples where he says that it is better for you that I go, that the Holy Spirit might come. He says, it's better for you that I leave. And we ask the question, what could be better than the physical presence of Jesus? What could be better than actually having a meal with Jesus? What could be better than having a conversation with Jesus, than playing with Jesus, playing tic-tac-toe with Jesus? What could be better than actually being in the physical presence of Jesus? Jesus. But our Lord Jesus Christ says that it is better for me to leave because if I leave, the Holy Spirit's going to come. That is to say that Jesus says, it's not enough for me to be next to you. I want to be so in you. I want to be so around you and not just with you individually. I want to fill the earth with my presence. And so it is better for me to leave that the Holy Spirit can come. That's what we, Jesus says in John chapter 16. But what Jesus then says is that the Holy Spirit has a particular task, and that is to shine the light on Jesus. 
Verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. He will tell you what is to come, and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. Notice something. The Holy Spirit doesn't want the glory. And although the Spirit is, is God. The Spirit takes a back seat so that Jesus can shine. The Holy Spirit is just fine letting Jesus shine. The raps start coming out just, just like that. Just come like that. <laughs> the Holy Spirit is content bringing glory to Jesus. And what we have to take a moment to just pause on is to, to just take a quick reflection, a theological reflection on the nature of the Trinity. Because the Trinity, we just sang about praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit three in one. The Trinity is perhaps the most beautiful theology that we have, and yet it's most, most mysterious and sometimes confusing. Because the church believes that there is one God in three persons, that the Holy Spirit is not a force, the Holy Spirit is not some ambiguous power. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, co-eternal, co-equal with the Father and the Son. This is what the Nicene Creed, a creed that the church has confessed for almost 2,000 years, declare, where the church says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified. The church believes in one God, in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but within the Trinity, there is no lust for power. Within the Trinity, there is no lust for glory. The Trinity is eternally and perpetually other-focused. And we see the interaction of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the Scriptures, where the Father is always bragging about His Son. This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And the Son is always bragging about the Father. I only do what I see the Father doing. And the Holy Spirit exists to shine the spotlight on the Son to the glory of the Father. Amen. And so what we see is this eternal, cosmic kind of uh, hot potato that the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and the Father are engaged in. If you've ever played hot potato, you know the game is to, you know, to take the potato and throw it to the next person. Take it, throw it, take it, throw it, take it, throw it. That's what it's like with the Trinity. There's this ongoing, ever-flowing uh, deferral of glory. You're glorious. No, you're glorious. You're glorious. No, you're glorious. It just, it just keeps on going. That there's no lust for power within the Trinity. That the Trinity is other-focused. And we need this truth because the church often is not other-focused. And the church often has a struggle keeping Jesus as the focus. Again, the Holy Spirit is most present when Jesus is most central. And we need this word, brothers and sisters, because in the history of the church, Jesus has not always been central. In the history of the church, there are times where money is more central than Jesus. That politics is more central than Jesus. That power is more central than Jesus. And any time we see that something else is taking the centrality of Jesus Christ in the midst of the church, the church ceases to be the church. And the Holy Spirit then has one job description. The focus of the Holy Spirit is to lead the church in keeping Jesus as the central focus. That's what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives collectively and in our lives individually. Help us to keep our Lord Jesus Christ the most central thing in our lives. And I'm not talking about Jesus being central in a kind of super spiritual in a, a way that does not have any implications for our social world. I'm talking about the way of Jesus, the teachings of Jesus, the life of Jesus, that our lives would be wrapped around Jesus, absorbed around our Lord Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ would be more than just an accessory to our lives. 
but he would be the very foundation of our lives. And so the church has needed over and over again to be reminded of the centrality of Jesus Christ. That our allegiance is to Jesus Christ and to no one else. This is why whenever uh, election season comes on, the church would do well to remember that our allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And not to Republicans and not to Democrats or whoever else is. Our allegiance is to Jesus Christ and the way of the kingdom of God. That when the world is tearing itself apart as it has been, especially the past week in regards to the Supreme Court ruling, that our lives would be and social imagination will be informed by the centrality of Jesus Christ. That we would take our talking points, that we would take the way we interact with others, the ways that we see those who disagree with us, not from a mainstream media kind of way, but that our lives would be saturated with Jesus Christ and the way of his kingdom. The question for our lives is to what degree is Jesus central in your life? To what degree is Christ the foundation of all that you say and all that you live and all the ways that you show up in the world? To be a follower of Jesus is not to have Jesus as an accessory of our lives, but to be the very foundation. He is the air that I breathe, the water that I drink. In him I live, I move, I have my being. And if that's not your experience, may the Holy Spirit awaken us. Amen. Amen. To having Jesus Christ as the very center of our existence. That the way of the kingdom would be the way that we see the world and engage with the world. And so the Holy Spirit exists to glorify Jesus. And if the Holy Spirit is inside of us, the Holy Spirit is to lead us to live lives that glorify Jesus and work for the blessing of others. And yet, there is a big problem before us. The problem is instead of focusing on glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ and living and working for the blessing of others, we find ourselves in a society that increasingly looks inward. Not inward for the sake of self-understanding, but turned inward in a way in which we center ourselves. When I think about what keeps us from glorifying Jesus, what keeps us from thinking about others, what keeps us from modeling the kingdom of God, there's so many uh, problems and challenges and obstacles before us, but I just want to highlight two of them. And I wonder to what degree these two realities are inside of us, inside of our church, permeating our nation. There are two real obstacles that get in the way of glorifying Jesus and and being other-oriented. And the first obstacle is simply narcissism. We live in a society that is increasingly narcissistic. Narcissism is just this intense preoccupation with ourselves. An intense preoccupation with ourselves. And it's so easy to live a life that's so oriented around myself, oriented around my perspectives, oriented around my comfort, oriented around me, me, me. St. Augustine said the, 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 the word is sin. The, a world that's marked by sin is a world that is, and here's in Latin, in curvatus in se, that is turned in itself. How do you know someone's being marked by sin? We are perpetually turned in on ourselves to the point where we no longer glorify God and work for the blessing of others. We are centering ourselves. And what we see in our world is a world that's increasingly marked by this kind of narcissism. Whether that's been formally diagnosed or not, we all have traces of narcissism inside of us which always makes me ask the question as it relates to social media as a narcissistic power I often wonder it's like the chicken and egg conversation did social media make us narcissistic or are we simply expressing the narcissism that's already in us and the answer is yes 
There was a study done by Huffington Post a couple of years ago that talked about the, uh, the cross-generational ways in which narcissism impacts our lives. And this quote needs to be updated because uh, there are certainly more uh, social media apps, but it says that the, the research that was published in the journal Computers in Human Behavior shows that Twitter fuels younger adults' narcissistic tendencies by acting as a megaphone for their thoughts, while Facebook fuels middle-aged adults' narcissistic tendencies by serving as a mirror where they can curate images of themselves. For so many of us, we are so self-oriented. The world revolves around me. It happens in big ways and it happens in small ways. I've mentioned this before. One of the ways that it manifests is whenever we take a picture with a group of people. Whenever we take a picture with a group of people, where do our eyes go? To ourselves. That's the first place where our eyes go. We just had a leadership retreat a couple of weeks ago, or last week actually, a bunch of our leaders, look at those faces, and, and then they took a picture and they showed it to me, and the first thing is, like, let me see how I look, let me see how I look. <laughs> and here's the thing about these pictures. The thing about these pictures is this. Everyone else can be in the picture looking busted. But if you're looking good, <laughs> do you like the picture? Yeah, you like the picture. People are going to have stuff in their teeth looking the wrong way. But if you're looking good, you say, we should frame this one. I'm looking really good here. Let's frame it. And it's a real simple way in which we can be so self-absorbed, looking at ourselves. I read something about Zoom, that on Zoom, uh, it's important that we, we stop the self-view of ourselves. If you have watched Zoom, because if you have your picture up there, about 98% of the time, you're looking at your self-talk. Come on, somebody. I, 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 I. You, you, you thought you were alone. No, 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 no. Which is why if you just hide self-view, it, it just helps you to be more present to other people. But when you have, you're, you're thinking about how you look and, and how you said and, and, and your response and all that there. So it might be helpful just to, to hide self-view. But this speaks to our overwhelming tendency to be in curvatus in se, to be focused on ourselves, curved in on ourselves. And we are reminded that the Holy Spirit is not curved in on the Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is other-focused. That the Holy Spirit is focused on our Lord Jesus Christ, making sure that Jesus gets glory. And yet, our lives often do not reflect this truth. And so we have narcissism, a way of turning inward, where we view all of the world through our particular vantage point and expect everyone now to orient their lives around the way I see things. A world that's turned in on itself. This is where we get things like Christian nationalism, Racism and xenophobia, where we see things like ethnocentrism, a way of orienting the world around myself. And this narcissism, if we're not careful, leads to another power that's at work in the world. And that power is jealousy. And the Holy Spirit is not narcissistic, and the Holy Spirit is not jealous. The Holy Spirit lives free from narcissism and free from jealousy. And when you are in the Spirit and the Spirit is in you, you too will begin to live free from narcissism and free from jealousy. You know, it's funny, the thing about jealousy, very few people admit to being jealous because it's kind of, it, it feels petty and it feels beneath us to say that I'm jealous. And yet jealousy is something that hits us often. You see someone with a new car and you go, mm, you're feeling a certain way. New house, feeling a certain way. New boyfriend, feeling a certain way. And our lives are so oriented towards 
uh, just jealousy. And what begins to happen when there is jealousy is jealousy leads to a kind of revelation of what's near and dear to our hearts. What we get most jealous of is often reveals what's most dear to my heart. For example, I love music. I am, I don't think there's been one minute in my life where I've been jealous of another musician. I love music. I don't think I've said, wow, that person plays the piano like that. We had Peter Roden. Remember Peter Roden? Peter Roden came to my house a couple of weeks ago to, to tune our piano, and, and then he started playing. I was just like, look at Peter Roden go. It was just phenomenal. There was not one moment where I was feeling jealous. I was admiring. What a fun, this is wonderful. Because jealousy often reveals what matters most to you. So jealousy doesn't emerge when I see musicians. You know when jealousy emerges? When I see another speaker. <laughs> Can I preach it like I feel it here? <laughs> when I see another, you know, a really gifted communicator, and if, especially if they're like my age or younger than me, I start going, wow, that person's really good. <laughs> mm. All right. And, and then they're really good. She's really good. And, 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 well, he's really good. And then I start feeling a certain way about myself. And what does jealousy do? It reveals what matters most. It's the check engine light of our soul, this jealousy. And, but the Holy Spirit is not jealous. The Holy Spirit believes there's enough to go around. You see, what jealousy does is jealousy creates a scarcity mentality in which there's a not enough to go around. And that in order for me to win, you need to lose. This is what's called the zero-sum game, that in order for me to win, you got to lose. There's not enough to go around. Politics is oriented around the zero-sum game. In order for me to win, you have to lose. Our social world is so dominated by the zero-sum game, which is why the last week that we've had is so challenging for a follower of Jesus because the world system would live in such a way of scarcity in which in order for my side to win, your side has to lose. And to think in that way, in order for me to win, you have to, it's worldly, demonic, it's the world system that has nothing to do with the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is marked by mutuality. The kingdom of God is marked by humility. The kingdom of God is marked by discernment, compassion, love. But if we think the only way that we can win, whatever side we is, is for you to lose, we are more worldly than anything else. And we are not living in the way of the kingdom of God. And so the Holy Spirit, you want to know when the Holy Spirit is in us? The Holy Spirit is in us not when we're just falling on the floor, shaking and baking and speaking in tongues. I haven't, had sh I haven't said shaking and baking in a long time, so... The Holy Spirit is in us when we move beyond a self-oriented way of life where our lives are about bringing glory to Jesus and blessing to others. And so how do we live in this reality? The Holy Spirit is not narcissistic. The Holy Spirit is not jealous. The Holy Spirit lives within the bond of Trinitarian love. The question is, how do we release ourselves? How do we get set free from being so self-oriented? Narcissistic, jealous. And there are three invitations I want to offer uh, to you very quickly before we sing. Number one, how do we live in this reality? Well, it requires us to live in the security of God's love and acceptance. The Holy Spirit is shy because the Holy Spirit is secure. Secure within the bonds of Trinitarian love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And to be a follower of Jesus is to be invited into the dance of the Spirit, Father and Son. To find ourselves within this divine dance of communion. 
As a follower of Jesus, my primary task is to live in the center of God's love. Because when you live in the center of God's love, you no longer need to center yourselves. You no longer need the spotlight shined on you all the time. You no longer need to be admired. You no longer need to be uh, affirmed in every way, every single day of your life. Because you're living from a deeper center now. The center of God's love. Which is why prayer, what is prayer? Prayer is opening ourselves to Trinitarian love. That when I pray, I'm not just trying to give God a laundry list of things that I need God to do. More than anything, I want to open myself to hear the voice that says, This is my son. This is my daughter. In you, I'm well pleased. Secure in the bond of Trinitarian love. What does it mean to live shy? It means that Jesus, secondly, and his glory is central, not our glory. Which is to say, anytime blessing comes our way, anytime God entrusts something to us, God blesses us, not for the sake of us, God blesses us for the sake of bringing glory to Jesus and the blessing of others. Some of you have been gifted, you've been privileged to get great education, you've been privileged with finances and gifted with just opportunity and access, and the question is, what does it mean to give glory to Jesus? We can focus on our salary, we can focus on our possessions, we can focus on, uh, on, on keeping up with the Jones, we can keep focus on all of that, or we can say, Lord, can you use the money that you've entrusted to me? Can you use the access that I have? Can you use the privilege and the power that I have for the blessing of others and the glory of your name? What would it look like for us to be so Jesus-focused and, and focused on the blessing of others? This is what the Holy Spirit longs to put in our hearts. When we volunteer and when we serve, that we would do it for the sake of Jesus' glory. And the blessing of others, which leads me to the third thing here. This gets expressed because our lives are then focused on the flourishing of other people. How do you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit? How do you know you're living in the Spirit? Well, one of the indicators is you live your life focused on the blessing and the flourishing of others. That God has entrusted something to you for the blessing and the flourishing of others. Whether it be finance, whether it be time. I often hear people, this is my time. That's a very worldly way of seeing the world. Because our time is not our time. Our time has been gifted to us by God. Which is why when I, when, I, when, I, when, I, when I see people not offering themselves in service to one another, I just, I don't have time to serve. I don't have time to volunteer. I don't have time to, to work for the flourishing of others. We are living in a way that's totally opposite of the kingdom of God and the way of Jesus. Because my time is not my time. And your time is not your time. If you're a follower of Jesus, you know, this time has been gifted to you by God. And now I want to use this time for the blessing and the flourishing of others, not just to climb the ladder, not just to promote myself, not just to take the next step, but to work for the flourishing and the blessing of others. How do you know the Holy Spirit is working inside of you when your life is so other-focused? What if, what if we got up in the morning and lived in this way? What if the questions that came to our hearts in the morning as you think about our spouse, our children, our roommates, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbor, what if the questions that we woke up with was, how can I serve you? What do you need today? How can I support you? Help me understand your perspective. Could you imagine what our families would look like in homes? If all of us were saying, what do you need? No, what do you need? No, what do you need? What, what do you need? How can I support you? No, how can I support you? How can I, how can I serve you? No, how can I serve you? Could you imagine the love, the ways that our conflicts would begin to fade away? 
we would begin to live in the bond of the Trinity in which there's no conflict. There's just life and love and abundance. Imagine if you said to your children, how can I serve you today? What can, imagine if your children said to you, how can I serve you today? Oh, now the Spirit's moving. You're like, I need a miracle, Pastor. I need a miracle. <laughs> we'll have prayer at the end. We're going to pray for that. We're going to pray for that. What would it look like if we were so focused on the flourishing of others and not simply our own lives? How do you know you're filled with the Holy Spirit? You're shy. Not timid. Not fearful. Not No, I want to now shine the spotlight. I want to center others. I, I want to enter into their world. I want to be a gift to them. And you know what I love about this? This is what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And in our Lord Jesus Christ, He has lived not for Himself. He lives and dies for you. The son is in the garden of Gethsemane about to be crucified and he goes to the father. Father, is there any way where this cup can pass? I just don't want to do this. this I don't want to experience a level of, of, of pain and cruelty. But quickly he says, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. I want to live for your glory and I want to live for the flourishing and the blessing of other people. Our Lord Jesus Christ, live this way towards you. He loves you with an everlasting love. He's poured out grace and mercy on you. Our Lord Jesus Christ brings about goodness and mercy and compassion for you. Our Lord Jesus Christ is so other-focused. And so to say, for us to focus on Jesus, we're not doing it so that Jesus can be focused on us. Any attempt of being focused on Jesus is a response to the commitment that Jesus Christ has to you. A commitment that would go as far as to die for you. To take on your sin. To forgive you. To redeem you. Our Lord is so other focused. And our Lord wants to fill us with that spirit. What would it look like if our world was marked by the shyness of the Holy Spirit? What would it look like in your home? your marriage, your workplace. If we can all, what would it look like in our congregation? Every time there's something that comes up in the news, crisis, it finds its way into our congregation. Racism within our congregation. Abortion in our congregation. No matter what the issues are out there, it finds itself into our congregation. And we as a congregation can live with a zero-sum game. Or we can live with humility and curiosity and compassion and discernment and prayer and be other-focused and not divide the world in two the way our society very neatly does, but live with a genuine spirit where our minds and social imaginations or oriented around the flourishing of others. What would it look like for us to live in this way? You know what it would look like? It would look like the bond of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we live in such a world that's turned in on itself. A world marked by narcissism and jealousy. A world that does not think about neighbor. A world that is not about bringing you glory. But Lord, you have redeemed us so that we would be oriented around you 
that our lives will be absorbed in your life, consumed by your life, consumed by your teachings, consumed by your love and justice and mercy and compassion. Lord Jesus, may we be caught up in you. May we orient our lives around you. May we experience communion with you. And may we take your teaching seriously. May we bring expression to you. And so we sing to you now. We worship you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. let's all stand. Let's sing together. have our prayer team come forward you know worship is an opportunity for us to set our hearts and our affections on God one of the ways that we center God in the life of our worship and gathering is by singing I wonder if we could just sing through that chorus again just praise the Father praise the Son 
I want my life to be oriented around Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want every decision I make to be oriented around Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want my life to be oriented around Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want Jesus to get glory through my life. Don't you want that? I want, I, want, I want the world to see something about the loving nature of Jesus Christ through me. I want to be consumed with Jesus. I want to be absorbed in the Trinitarian bond of love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want, to, I want that to be my lived reality, the air that I breathe, the water that I drink. And one of the ways that we do that is in prayer. It was St. Augustine and in song. St. Augustine said, the person who sings prays twice. How nice is that? You want to double your prayers? Start singing. And so could we sing just praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Holy Spirit. And with everything we have, let our lives be oriented around our God. Let's sing that together. Praise the Father. Praise the Son and praise the Spirit, three in one. Guide of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King. Let's sing that out. Let's lift our hands. our prayer team here. Listen, if you came into church today and your soul has just been so worn out by not just the past week, how about the past year, the past two years, the past decade, your entire life. I mean, if you're worn out, life can be at times just so draining. And if you need just someone to pray for you, our prayer team is here. We'd love to uh, join you and pray for you and offer words of encouragement uh, to you. At the end of our service, we have as well our, uh, do we have a sermon discussion time on, online here? Uh, yeah, we have a sermon discussion time. On, so if you're joining online and you just want to have a conversation with one of our pastors who will be hosting that, feel free to click that link, and we'd love to connect with you online. Maybe you came uh, to our service today, maybe you're watching online, and you've never said yes to Jesus Christ. You've never found yourself saying, I want to follow Christ. I want to live for the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I want to have my life uh, absorbed in Christ. I want to take the next step. I want forgiveness. I want grace. I want mercy. We, there are a couple of ways we can serve you along those lines. You can come up for prayer and talk to someone from our prayer team. You can also text the phrase, yes to Jesus, uh, to that number, 718-424-0122. And one of our pastors would love to help you take the next step in your spiritual journey. As we close our service, let me invite you to open your hands towards heaven to receive a blessing. And here is my hope. My hope is that you would live a life that's so uh, about the glory of Jesus and the blessing of others. May this message uh, shape the ways you interact with those in your home, those in your neighborhood, how can I serve you? How can I bless you? How can I support you? May those words find expression in our lives. And may we point to the Trinitarian love of God. Brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of the living God, may the Lord bless you and keep you. 
make his face to shine upon you and fill you with peace. And may you walk out of this building and out of this online gathering in the power of the Holy Spirit. May you live in the bond of Trinitarian love, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And may you be a blessing to the world around you. I bless you all in the strong, in the beautiful, in the resurrected name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. Grace and peace to you all.